Thank you. What I plan to do over the next hour or so is to talk to you about really what assessment for learning is and what it isn't, and to leave you with some practical techniques for formative assessment or assessment for learning. When the government heard that assessment for learning was probably the most significant impact on student achievement, they made it into their own policies, they made it into government policy. One of the interesting things about working with government is they're always in a hurry. I was working with a senior civil servant from the DCSF, the Department for Carpets and Soft Furnishings, as we used to call it, and he was talking about the need to get his minister a quick win. He was saying to me that if he does very well at the DCSF, that his next stop will be the Treasury, and if he does badly, it'll be DEFRA. <laughs> so there's this search for very quick wins, and so we've seen a number of things like the national strategies. The impact of the national strategies in primary schools, the bill was about 500 million pounds. <clears throat> Net impact, one extra student reaching level four per primary school per year. It would have been cheaper just to bribe the students by giving them a thousand pounds just to pass the test. We've seen things like specialist schools and academies. Specialist schools get better results than non-specialist schools, but they also get more money. And by a spooky coincidence, the improvement in results is exactly what you'd expect if you just gave them the extra 129 pounds per student per year. Academies improve faster than non-academies, but they start from a lower baseline. And when you control for that, you find that academies improve at exactly the same speed as non-academies starting with the same level of achievement. More recently, a spectacular own goal has been scored with classroom assistance. What we've discovered is that classroom assistance actually lower the performance of the students they're meant to help. On average, nationally, the effect has been to lower student achievement because these people are never given any time to plan, the teachers aren't given time to work with them, and because they're often not very well trained, they see their task as helping the students do the work, which often transfers the intellectual heavy lifting from the student to the classroom assistant. So it's not surprising that when the government wanted to do assessment for learning, it tried to do it very quickly by rolling it out as a strategy. I heard uh, David Miliband and Charles Clark at the time talking about this, and it was very clear what they had in mind for assessment for learning was what I call now long cycle formative assessment. In many secondary schools now, there is usually a deputy head in charge of the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet enables you to predict with quite surprising accuracy which students are going to pass and which students are going to fail GCSE maths next year, because maths is what matters now, isn't it, really? And basically, a school's position in the league tables cannot exceed the performance of its maths department, because there are more kids who get English but not maths than there are who get maths but not English. And so these people are laboring away, and they, and they are, because they are compliant with the DCSF AFL strategy, they think they're doing AFL, because what they're doing is they are tracking the student's progress and using it to predict their results. <coughs> doesn't tell you what to do about it, but at least your impending failure will come with plenty of advance warning, and you can still and you can begin to start polishing up the CV when things are going very badly. The second kind of take on AFL by the government was this idea of children should know where the, what levels they're at. I was in a school the other day wh where the school had just finished a big building schools for the future project, very nice buildings, head was showing me around, and asked me did I want to see an AFL lesson puzzled me slightly. I thought, I thought that AFL should be a part of every lesson. But anyway, the, this school's idea of an AFL lesson is the teacher going around and asking every student what level you're at. And then it hit me. This teacher thinks she's doing AFL, assessment for learning, because what Paul Black and I said back in 1998 was that students need to know where they are in their learning, where they're going, and how to get there. I asked this little boy, I said, where are you in, in your learning? He said, I'm level four. I said, where do you need to be? I said, I, I need to be level five. <laughs> what are you, gonna, are you gonna do to get there? I'm gonna pay more attention in class and do my homework. But because this teacher thinks her students know where they are in their learning, where they're going and how to get there, she thinks she's doing AFL. And this is further undermined by Ofsted, who think that the idea is that they should be able to walk into a class and ask students what level they're working at. Now the problem with our levels, I don't know if you realize this, but they were designed so that each student would progress by one level every two years. That was the design. 
It came from some work that Margaret Brown and I'd done on graded assessment that showed if you wanted to be able to give every student in secondary school a reasonable chance of achieving one level every year, you would need 20 levels. And nobody thought you could actually get away with having 20 levels. The maths and the science teachers might have stood for it, but the English teachers certainly wouldn't. And so, <clears throat> instead of having one level every year with 20 levels, the compromise was one level every two years with 10 levels. But the consequence of this is that the faster, the faster achieving students will go up by one level every four terms, but the slower students will go up by one level every three years. So Jane, you started the year at level four and you've worked really hard and you're still at level four. Well done. Not very motivating, is it? So what's the response? Sublevels. I know of a school that now records students' levels to two places of decimals. They actually describe the student as being at 4.45. The problem with using those sublevels is they're not very accurate. So trying to work out whether a student has gone up or down a sublevel is like trying to work out whether you've gained or lost a pound in weight with weighing scales that are only accurate plus or minus seven pounds. And so the, this, this, this constant idea that assessment for learning should be about assessment, I think, points out the, the, the mistake that Paul Black and I made back in 1998. We should probably not have called this stuff assessment. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. A science teacher is doing uh, some physics, doing mass and weight, and at the end she gives every student a 3 by 5 index card, and they are asked to write down what is the difference between mass and weight. Okay, and then at the end of the lesson she stands by the doorway, because these are these students' exit tickets. And she stands by the doorway and they have to hand them in. And, th and if there's only two or three words written on the card, she says, go back and give me a proper answer. But as long as there's a decent amount of writing there, she accepts it, the student can leave. After all the students have gone, she then reads through these cards and then puts them in the bin. Because she now knows where to start tomorrow's lesson. That is assessment for learning. Because what that teacher is doing is collecting information that allows her to adjust her teaching to better meet her student learning needs. It's not about grading, it's not about scoring. And the big mistake that Paul Black and I made, as I said earlier, is by calling this assessment, everybody puts it into the Ofsted box called assessment recording and reporting. And it doesn't belong in there. It belongs in a box called good teaching. Another teacher tried these exit passes and she actually produced an interesting wrinkle. She gets the students to write their names on the back and then, when, after she's collected them in and reads through the answers, she then uses them as placemats for tomorrow's lesson. So she puts the names face up by making sure that every group has at least two students who gave a good answer to the question. So then, the first ten minutes of the next lesson is discuss your answers to this question. And of course, the students who got a correct answer don't know that they are there because they got a correct answer because they haven't been told whether their answer is correct or not but it produces a very, very helpful discussion because you've got a, a, a mix of opinions. And again, it's formative assessment because this teacher did something she couldn't have done had she not collected in the information. So, now, uh, teachers have always done this. Teachers have always used information about student achievement to adjust their teaching to better meet the student's learning needs. Unfortunately, most teachers rely on very poor quality information. Most teachers rely on how glazed the expressions on students' faces are, whether they're nodding or frowning. That's why children learn it's very dangerous to frown in classrooms. Because if you tr frown, the teacher will say, you okay, do you understand this? So students learn to nod and smile. <laughs> and it's very seductive. You know, when you've got a class that's nodding and smiling at you, you just plow on. This is working so well. This is going great, this lesson, isn't it? <laughs> So some teachers realize that that's uh, a dangerous and seductive approach, so they actually have a slight wrinkle where they do the thinking thumbs. So they ask the students, okay, everybody okay with that? Thumbs up, thumbs down, and what do you get? <laughs> Lots of thumbs up. But what's extraordinary is how little you need to change that to get something very, very much more powerful. A chemistry teacher was doing a chemical reaction and it was phosphoric acid and hydrogen, I don't know, hydrogen sulfate, I can't remember now. Anyway, she'd written it up on the board and she, as an unbalanced chemical equation, and then she asked students to come up and, and suggest how to balance it. So the students came up and um, the students sort of doubled the amount of hydrogen or whatever, um, of, of, of um, mercury uh, and whatever, and then they sat down and then another student came up. And after, two, and after that, nobody else wanted to play with it, they thought it was all right. The teacher then said to the whole class, 
is that now correct? Yes or no? And do you see how different that is from the everyone okay with that? Because there's now no place to hide. Because if you say it's okay and there's still a mistake in there, you've shown you don't understand. And if you say there's still a mistake in there, you know what's going to happen, don't you? The teacher's going to ask you to come up and fix it. So just that very small switch from is that okay, you know, everyone okay with that to is that now correct encapsulates this shift from regarding this as a kind of fairly low-key interactive process to being one, a, a genuine assessment process where a teacher is genuinely using information about the effects of her teaching to adjust her teaching to better meet the student's learning needs. And it's done in real time. I sometimes say, if you haven't used information about student achievement to adjust your teaching before the kids have left the classroom, you're playing catch up. And if you haven't done so by the time the next time they arrive in your classroom, it's too late. It's that very short cycle because what it does is to improve teachers' responsiveness to students' achievement and improve student engagement. And so the reason that this has such an impact is because it changes the dynamic in the classroom completely. So as I said earlier, the key processes are where students are in their learning, where they're going and how to get there. And if you think about the role of teachers, peers, and learners, you get this matrix of nine cells, which I think can be usefully grouped into five what we call key strategies. Now, the first one is probably the most important and the least understood. <coughs> Many schools now have a policy that you must have a learning objective written on the board. So what happens is the teacher writes up a learning objective for every lesson, the students copy it into their exercise books, and all participants subsequently ignore it for the rest of the lesson. But the real reason this is so difficult is because doing good learning intentions is much harder than people assume. Because most people get it at the wrong level of specificity. Shirley Clark uses the following example to illustrate this. There's a geography teacher who is teaching her students and the learning intention is to understand the impact of sugar production on sugar producers. So the students work on sugar production and sugar producers and at the end of the two weeks the teacher wants to work out whether her teaching has been successful so she asks the students questions about sugar production and sugar producers. Mm -hmm. And of course the students get that right because they've been doing nothing else for the last two weeks. The point is it would be far smarter to make the learning intention to understand the impact of production on producers for the context of the learning to be sugar production and then for the success criterion to be can they transfer their knowledge to a different context like banana production. And that illustrates something that every teacher actually realizes but no teacher ever crystallizes. We are never interested in students' ability to do what we teach them to do, ever. We are only interested in their ability to do something else with it, to generalize. If a maths teacher teaches students how to add these two <coughs> fractions, they don't care about these two fractions anymore. Of course they can add these two fractions, I just showed them how to do it. What you're interested in is, can they add two other fractions? And so this notion of generalizability is at the heart of effective teaching. We, we never care about students' ability to do what we teach them. We need them to be able to do something else with it. And that's why the best learning intentions understand that. There's a, there's a generalized learning intention, there's a specific context for learning, and then a transfer of learning for the success criterion. And in fact, that also addresses the problem of differentiation. The idea is you teach all students the same with the same learning intention, but the differentiation is how far away from the context of learning can students generalize their knowledge. Basically, the more able students should be able to push it to a much more remote, what is called a distal um, context. So you could actually think about you know, very, very similar contexts, slightly different contexts, remote and quite distant contexts. Engineering effective discussions and tasks that are acti elicit a evidence of learning. Some people call this questioning. Questioning is a very narrow notion, actually quite limited. PE teachers very rarely question students. They get them to do stuff, do a forward roll, do a pike or a tuck on the trampoline. So it's all those things that you do to elicit evidence of student achievement. With students with very profound learning difficulties, you might use touch. But even for more academic subjects, with more academic students, Often, asking questions is not the best thing to do. A man called James T. Dillon in the United States um, has done a lot of work on this. And what he's shown is that it's often better to, uh, to make statements than to ask questions. He, um, he's done a lot of research. And what he's found is that when teachers ask kids questions like, 
which country was most to blame for the outbreak of World War I, and you'll get people saying, you know, Germany, Russia, Serbia, France, Britain. And it's almost like kind of plumping in a popularity contest. But if you say Russia was most to blame for the outbreak of World War I, students will either agree or disagree with that, but they feel impelled to give you a reason. So by making statements rather than asking questions, you tend to deepen the, 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 the conversation immediately because students know that it's not just agreeing or disagreeing that's important, they know they have to give reasons. Providing feedback that moves learners forward. <clears throat> Back in 1998, Paul Black and I said that, that comments should be given rather than grades, and many teachers, to be fair, took to that. They gave comments rather than grades. Unfortunately, they weren't very good comments in many cases. They were things that were wrong with the last piece of work. And the reason the students didn't want, want to read the comments is because nobody cares about how well or badly you did on a piece of work that's now in the past, that's done and dusted, and that you're never going to get to do again. So there's a, we didn't actually do a very good job of communicating to teachers what we meant. And what we were pointing out was that really, you need to be clear about whether this is a summative or a formative assessment. If it's a summative assessment, give them the, and you must give them a grade or a score, give them the grade or a score. Don't waste your time writing a comment, because they won't read it. But if you give them a comment, then make sure there's a chance for them to use that comment to make their work better. So, I, so the, the way to, th to sum this up is never grade students while they're learning. By all means, give them a grade at the end of learning, whether that's every six weeks, every two weeks, or whatever you call a sequence of learning. But don't grade students while they're learning. So feedback during learning should be the view through the windscreen rather than the view through the rear view mirror. Or as somebody once memorably described it, it's like the difference between having a medical and a post-mortem. And the trouble is most of our students get post-mortems. These last two, activating students as learning resources for one another and activating students as owners of their own learning, these are often called by other people self-assessment and peer assessment, but I think those are very narrow notions. So we see these five key strategies as ways of bringing in other important issues. So for example, activating students as learning resources for one another brings in collaborative learning, reciprocal teaching and peer assessment. Activating students as owners of their own learning brings in metacognition, motivation, interest, attribution, as well as self-assessment. So they're useful blanket terms for helping teachers think about the design of their teaching. The big idea is simply we use evidence about student learning to adjust our teaching to better meet their needs. I flew back from America a couple of weeks ago, and I'm very glad that our pilot didn't navigate the way that most teachers assess. Because had he done so, he had set out from New York with a bearing of 070 degrees and a planned flying time of six and a half hours. And after six hours and 15 minutes, he'd begin looking for an airstrip and set down at the nearest one and then say, is this Heathrow? And the ground crew say, nope, it's Paris. And the pilot says, everybody off. I've got another job to go to. Because we do, isn't it? We teach students, and at the end, we give them a test. And if they've done well, we say, great. And if they haven't done well, we say, too bad. We're on to chapter seven tomorrow. So all I'm suggesting is that we need to, is we need to adjust our teaching like our, like our pilot did. So you start off with a very clear idea of where you, where you are. You, you're clear about where you're going. You plan a route. Then you begin the journey. And you take readings along the way and, take, and change course as conditions dictate. So it's a very simple idea of just that notion of, of just generally continually modifying your, your teaching. And here's why. It's, a simple, it's, it's the simplest and most complicated thing in the world. Children do not learn what we teach. We teach these great lessons. And we take in their exercise books, and we wonder what planet they were on when we were teaching this stuff, don't we? The sense they make of our teaching is completely unpredictable. And that's why assessment is the single most impor important process in teaching. Because if you're not assessing, you might as well be speaking into a video camera that's relayed to students in another room. The heart of interaction in teaching is assessment. It's a process of realizing that the most important thing in teaching is where the learner starts from. And because as soon as you start teaching, those students will be in different places, you better know where they are before you try to do anything else. It's a very simple metaphor. It's just incredibly hard to do. OK, time for you to do some work now. So here are two fractions questions um, from the third international maths and science study. Fraction one, question one, sorry, success rate 88%. Question two, success rate 46%. So I'd like you just to think work on your tables to discuss why you think that second question 
was found to be so much more difficult by the students. Okay? Two minutes. Why is that second item so much more difficult than the first? Could you give me a number between 1 and 10, please? 1 and 20, please. 7. 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, what do you talk about on your table? That. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we were trying to work out the answer. Okay. <laughs> did, you, did you come to any conclusions about why that second item was more difficult for the students than the first? Those that you explain. No, no, I've asked you. <laughs> Because with the first lot of fractions, the numbers are smaller and they all go into each other. Okay. It doesn't make sense. No, no, no. But that's, that's with fine. the others, they're larger. Right. So you're given, I mean, a math teacher would probably say you're given the lowest common multiple in the first question but not in the second. But, you know, they're, they're simpler, they go into each other, is absolutely fine. Okay, thank you. Number between 1 and 20, please. 15. 15, okay. Table 15. Oh. One teacher in 100 sees the really important point here. 46% got it right, so 39% got it wrong. First of all, that's important. <coughs> if 46% got it right, that means 54% got it wrong. So therefore, were children's responses at random, 18% would have chosen each of the wrong answers. 39%, two and a half times as many as expected, chose the same wrong answer. Why? Well, it turns out, and the, 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 the Israeli researchers didn't actually find this out until they asked the students, a lot of students think that have this naive strategy because teachers say a sixth is smaller than a fifth because it's been divided into more pieces. Even though six is bigger than five, a sixth is smaller than one-fifth because it's divided into more pieces. So children come away with this idea that the smallest bottom makes the biggest fraction and the biggest bottom makes the smallest fraction. So when you apply that strategy to this question, which fraction is the smallest, look for the largest denominator, find six, choose A, correct. Which fraction is the largest, look for the smallest denominator, find four, choose B, incorrect. And here's the clincher. If you add 46% to 39%, you get something very close to 88%, which suggests that a lot of the students who got the first question right got it right for the wrong reason. And this is the crucial thing about our questioning. When we ask our students questions and we get the answers we were hoping for, what do we conclude? That their understanding matches ours. But if the questions we ask are more like the first and the second, the students might well give us the right answers when their thinking is completely different. So what is extraordinary is that we don't yet, I mean, no teacher that I've ever met has clarified for themselves that the crucial thing about a question is that it's, it's, it's basically an attempt to diagnose the state of a student's brain. And there are two kinds of states. One is that they have the correct cognitive rules in there, and the other is that they have incorrect cognitive rules in there. And what we want is questions that can tell us whether they've got the right things in their heads. And most of our questions, both wrong answers and right answers, both right thinking and wrong thinking, map onto the same answer. So we learn nothing about the quality of, their answer, of thinking by hearing their answers. Now, these misconceptions that students come up with, uh, you know, can you draw an upside down triangle? Now, in most classrooms, if I ask you a question like that, one or two people would say yes or no, other people would sort of avert their gaze and hope that I don't pick on them to have to sort of clarify their thinking. So what I'd like to do now is to ask you to vote. Thumbs up if you think you can draw an upside down triangle, thumbs down if you think you can't. Can you draw an upside down triangle? Vote now, please. And can I just point out that I can tell if you haven't voted? <laughs> okay, thank you. Pretty hard line lot here. Okay. So you think that that's not an upside down triangle? You, just say it's a, you would just say it's a triangle, wouldn't you? Yes. Yeah. What? It's, it can't be upside down. I would say it's obviously upside down. It's obviously upside down. <laughs> yeah. I agree with you. I agree with you. Well, of course, the maths teachers are saying it's a triangle no matter which way up it is, so therefore an upside-down triangle is a, is a, is a silly thing to say. Um, what, what, what's the formula for the area of a triangle? 
Half the base. Half the base times the height. I thought you said it didn't have a right way up. Do you realize how inconsistent we are? Yeah? Can you get a piece of scrap paper? Can you write down somewhere four and a half? Just write down four and a half somewhere. And somewhere else, just write down 4x. OK, what's the mathematical operation between the 4 and the half? It's, a, it's not 4 times a half. No, it's not. It's 4 plus a half, isn't it? It's, a, it's addition. What's the mathematical operation between the 4 and the x? Now, had anybody noticed how inconsistent mathematics notation was before now? Had you, had you noticed that there's a different implied relationship to those numbers before I pointed it out? No, that's probably, cause you, that's probably why you're here. Because had you stopped to ask questions like, excuse me, miss, but this is really confusing because sometimes when you've got a four and a number, like a half, it's an, it's an add, and sometimes when you've got an x, it's a times. And the teacher says, don't be so stupid. <laughs> yeah, so students often ask questions uh, which are really quite clever. And so students might say, that's an upside-down triangle because the base is at the top. <laughs> and why do they think it's got a base? Because the triangle the teacher said the formula for the area of a triangle is half base times height. Now, actually, if this is true, of course, we would, we would expect to find zero hits in Google for inverted triangles. In fact, if you go and Google the phrase inverted triangle, you get two sets of hits. One is from fashion web pages, where um, the, the phrase inverted triangle is used to describe women's body shapes. Uh, and the inverted triangle is one where the shoulders are bigger than the hips, and the triangle is used to describe the shape in which the hips are bigger than the shoulders. But of course, you think that they're all the same because there's no such thing as an inverted triangle. Um, the, the other set of hits are to do with um, Nazi Germany, where Jews were made to wear armbands with yellow triangles on them, and they were that way up, and they're described as inverted triangles, which I think is a perfectly powerful piece of communication. If I said draw an inverted triangle, that's what you draw. So the point is, in a maths classroom, there's no such thing, but elsewhere there is. And this illustrates a very important point. When children get things wrong, when children appear to display misconceptions, they're often using perfectly good conceptions in the wrong place. When a student says, I didn't saw it, or I spended all my money, what they're doing is using a rule that works in most settings, but just happens not to work in a small number of cases, the one, the, one of the wins that you, you just happen to get them um, caught on. And this, this, this idea, these so-called misconceptions, they're not the result of bad teaching. Students are constantly making up models of the world around them. If you ask children between the ages of four and seven, what causes the wind? What do they say, do you think? Beans. Beans, no. Four to, no you're obviously tainted by your secondary school experience. Um, four to seven year olds don't say beans. 12 to 13 year olds probably do, but. Sorry? Clouds. clouds, yes, clouds comes up quite a lot. But trees comes up more often. Trees. Isn't that wonderful? Because when the wind's blowing, the trees are all doing this. And they make those connections. So the important thing about questioning is that students aren't passive receptacles. They're active in making up the models of, 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 of what they see in classrooms as well as the rest of the world. And you better have good questions to find out where they are. This, this is another maths example here. 3 a equals 24, a plus b equals 16. You ask kids, how, you know, what's the answer? And they say, can't do it. You can't do it. Well, I keep on getting b is 8, but it can't because a is. Somewhere along the line, this student acquired the belief that a and b had to be different. Where did they get that belief from? From me, because every single previous example I'd ever used, I'd always used a different number for a and b, and I hadn't noticed that, and that student had. I was working with some students the other day, and I asked them, can you have a right angle with two, uh, can you have a triangle with two right angles? And it was quite interesting, because they didn't know. Because that looks like a really boring question, doesn't it? Because there's two answers, yes and no, and one of them is wrong. <laughs> looks pretty close, doesn't it? But these kids didn't know. So one kid was trying to build a really long, thin triangle, because his teacher had told him that parallel lines meet at infinity. Smart kid with a stupid teacher. <laughs> Another kid had uh, knew, knew that the angles had to add, add up to 180, knew that he'd used up two 90s already, so he wanted to know, can you have an angle of zero degrees? 
And a girl in the group said that she was pretty confident she could actually come up with a triangle with two right angles, provided she was allowed to have one corner of the triangle at the North Pole and the other two on the equator. To which the boy said, that's not a proper triangle. But what's interesting about that is it was a closed question, but it caused thinking because they didn't know the answer. It wasn't a recall question. <clears throat> so generating questions with colleagues is a good starting point. Nobody can do this on their own very well. One teacher said to me, you'll never do this well on your own because you'll always be victim to your own way of thinking about this. So working with a, one other colleague to come up with a good question is very powerful. As I said, closed versus open is not a particularly important consideration. Sometimes closed questions are great. Which way does light go, from my eye to what I'm seeing or from what I'm seeing to my eye? That's about as close a question gets. It's important to ask because a lot of kids think that light goes this way rather than this way. So if you know what you're looking for, closed questions can be fine. So causing thinking or provide data that informs teaching. Closed versus open doesn't matter. Low order versus high order does. Are you testing recall or are you getting kids to think? But it's important to realize that you should only use wait time when you've asked a high order question. If kids don't know the capital of Paris, the capital of France, <laughs> if kids don't know the capital of France, extra time isn't going to help. And this is why teachers actually don't think very carefully about pace. Now, the, tr the trouble is we get videos from the DFE showing pace in lessons, which actually has this extraordinary teacher batting out questions in this amazing class, batting back answers. And it's really impressive, because these, these teachers firing out questions and the kids come back with the answers really quickly. And it's very impressive. It's just got nothing to do with learning, because no one can think of that speed. What you're seeing is a demonstration of a very highly <coughs> polished performance a very highly uh, rehearsed performance that is being conducted at such a speed that cognition is impossible. It's just reactions. And so pace in lessons as often comes from slowing things down as it does from speeding things up. So what we need to do is to think about how we can ing engender pace in lessons. <coughs> pace just means as much of the lesson time as possible is spent with the students' minds on. And, you know, we thought we were pretty cool with the three-part lesson with the national strategies. I would like to see 11-part lessons. I would like to see teachers doing things like asking students questions, do a think pair share, and then a feedback, and then another activity. You know, really two or three, you know, two or three minute bursts of activity. So you're constantly making sure the students are thinking. But then at other times, I think students should actually be listening for maybe even half an hour to a story. <coughs> Seven King School in Essex, they've actually designed, as part of their BSF project, a 120-seat lecture theatre. So you can put four classes in there and have one person talking to them for an hour. And with really, you know, if, one, if each of us did our party pieces, I'm sure we could entertain a bunch of kids for an hour in a very formal setting. So it's about thinking about what's the learning going on here? You'd have thought that as people get more and more experienced that their IQ would matter less and less. But people choose for themselves jobs that match their preferred level of functioning. That's why Head Start, for example, worked when students were in Head Start. So students in Head Start or Sure Start, depending on which country you're in, um, they, they actually increased the IQs of working class children. But when they went back into other environments that were less challenging, their IQs went back to where they were before. Because they were no longer being challenged. So each of us tends to choose an environment that, la that matches our preferred level of cognitive activity. And that's why allowing students to raise their hands in classrooms is so dangerous. Because if you allow students to raise their hands, you are creating different cognitive niches for different students. You know, you ask a question, and in, some, you know, and in the classroom, there'll be some students who are dislocating their shoulders in their eagerness to show you they have an answer. And there'll be others who are trying to stay below the radar. The work of Neil Mercer at the Open University shows that those students who are engaging in everything the teacher is saying are actually getting smarter. It's extraordinary, but you can show an impact on IQ as measured by purely I spatial IQ tests, just from getting students to argue and discuss concepts in science, for example. But in the same classroom, there are children trying to stay below the radar. And they are, tr they are foregoing the opportunity to get smarter. So if you're allowing students to choose whether to participate in your classroom or not, you're making the achievement gap worse. Some, somebody once called it the Matthew effect. To those that have, much more shall be given, and from those who have nothing, what little they have will be taken away. 
So that's why no hands up is so important. And there's an important rider there, no hands up except to ask a question. So any student can raise their hand to ask a question, but the idea is that the standard operational rule should be, if a teacher asks a question, the teacher chooses the first person to answer. Now, if you've seen the TV program, you'll see the, the resistance that that caused. The kids hated it, the teachers hated it. But over time, it became quite a powerful technique. And, I, and I'm not saying you can't call, you know, allow kids to volunteer, as I modeled with you earlier on. I, had, I cho chose two people at random, and then I said, does anybody else have anything to say about this topic? So that's an, import, you know, that's an important way of letting those who want to say something say something. But the other point is that students know that the first move will always be random and you better have an answer. Point is this idea of high engagement classrooms is what you do with the student's response. Because when you start picking students at random, to begin with, they'll start saying, don't know. And the crucial thing is what you do with that. Because in some classrooms, the teacher says, OK, and goes to somebody else. Now let's think what happened here. The teacher says, I want this to be a classroom where everyone is thinking. The student says, I don't want to think. The teacher says, OK. The student has just won. So a smarter response is, OK, if you don't know, I'll come back to you. And get two or three different answers, and then come back to that student and say, OK, which of those answers do you like best? The idea is you always come back and, in, and require the student to engage. And it, even if it's a maths question with, with just one right answer, you come back to that student and say, now repeat the correct answer. So sometimes you need to lower the bar very low to get the student to act. Sometimes they'll keep on saying, don't know, until you just say, repeat after me. <laughs> But the point is you don't allow any student to opt out of engagement in the classroom. This idea of no opt out. Hot seat questioning. The idea here is that I ask a student a question and a second and a third to really probe that one student's thinking. Because most teachers scatter questions around the class as a method of keeping the kids on their toes. But there's no building. So it's just a really flat level of dialogue. By asking you three or four questions, I can really probe your thinking. And the students over there will be on task because they know that the next thing I'm going to do is to say, summarize what he just said. So there's other ways of keeping students awake without compromising the quality of your classroom dialogue. Um, now, when I was a teacher, the decision I made most often every single day was, do I need to go over this one more time or can I move on? How did I make that decision? I'd make up a question on the spur of the moment, ask the class, Six kids would raise their hands, I'd pick on one of them, they'd give me the correct answer, and I would say, good, and move on. How dumb is that? I'm assuming that the other 29 kids already knew the answer, or now are okay, because they've had one student utter the correct response. So if we're serious about improving our teaching, we have to make systematic use, and I would say once every lesson, of what I call all student response systems where you get a response from every single kid. You can buy a set of classroom clickers for 2,000 pounds from Promethean, or you can make up your own set like this, batteries not included. A class polls, first of all, you know, I might just ask quickly, um, I'm, not saying I'm doing global warming. So, global warming, do you think it's caused by humans, anthropogenic, or is it natural? So, anthropogenic or natural, what do you think? Natural. They may be saying that because they can't pronounce anthropogenic, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but the point is that then you quickly sound out the class to find out where to take the discussion. Because you need, you know, you, if you know what the students already think, you'll have a more productive discussion than if you don't. So that's why these cards can be very useful, ABCD cards. I mean, I think they're great. I mean, you know, some teachers are so worried. They were, they were really worried about students cheating. So the first time they used them, they had to kind of Students were told to choose their card underneath the desk and then put their head on the desk and hold up the card. <laughs> but what was interesting was that very soon they didn't care. We, we talked to some girls and they said they much prefer these to the lollipop sticks because with these cards, even if you get it wrong, there's always somebody else who's got the same wrong answer as you. And it, so the classroom became a safe place for making mistakes. Now, when I was talking to the producers of the classroom experiment program at the BBC and I said I wanted to get teachers to use these cards, they said that's very scary. And I said, why is that very scary? Well, everybody see, will see what answer you got. And I said, why is that scary? And they said, well, because you might get that wrong. And I said, why is that scary? Well, you should know. And I said, why? This is a classroom. If you know this stuff, you shouldn't be here. Yeah, the idea that the best students always answer teachers' questions correctly, well, in which case, we are probably wasting their time. 
This idea of a classroom where nobody dares make a mistake. It's a bit like going to the doctor and the doctor says, so what seems to be the trouble? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, so the idea of a classroom where, which, is one, which is safe for making mistakes, um, what, what one teacher uses these cards and she only uses four options for every question she uses, A, B, C, D. And if at least three students choose each, each option, she t sends the students to the letter corners because she's labelled the corners of her classroom A, B, C, D. So if you're in the C corner, your task is to convince everybody else in the C corner, how are we going to convince the others that C is the best answer? And you see this boy in discussion with his peers, listening to what they're saying, beginning to suspect that C might not have been such a smart choice after all. So you see him begin to kind of edge over towards the D corner. And of course, the reason he's edging is because he thinks he's cheating. I just think he's learned something. So the idea is that the teaching becomes more responsive you actually use the information to adjust your teaching to better meet the students' learning needs. Now, these require questions that, re that are prepared in advance. So you can't use them on the fly. I saw a lovely example the other day, though. Um, I don't know if you saw Miss Overbury in the, in the program, the English teacher. She did a really nice media studies lesson, um, which wasn't recorded, unfortunately. But it was about the Heisel Stadium tragedy. And they're looking at press coverage of this. And so that she, at the beginning of the lesson, she had a multiple choice question. Who was, who was to blame for this? A, Liverpool fans, B, Juventus fans, C, the police, D, the stadium authorities, and E, the football authorities. And so she got the students to vote hold up, and, and keep their cards on their desk so that she could organize the discussion more effectively. So she said, now you thought the Liverpool fans were to blame. Now you also thought the Liverpool fans were to blame for the same reason or for a different reason. Now you thought the Juventus fans were to blame. And so she was able to organize her discussion by bringing the students at the right time. And then they had this discussion. And at the end, she got them to vote again. And what was really nice was that every student held up at least two cards. So every student had a more complex view of this as a result of their discussion. The, 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 it wasn't a single cause and effect. But I thought it was a very nice, simple use of a, of a question like this, of things like this. Not for a right or wrong answer, but just to help the teacher have a more productive discussion. You can't make your teaching responsive unless you hear from all the students. So you have to engage the students. And the consequence of that is that you will then have evidence to adjust your teaching to better meet your students' learning needs. OK, um, let's look at feedback briefly. So this is a quite an important study because of the way it was controlled. There were 12 classrooms involved uh, in four schools. So there three classrooms in each school. In the first classroom in each school, as the students worked, they were given a score. 40 for the worst piece of work, 90 for the best, others in between. In the second classroom, they were given comments. Not wonderful comments, just things like, you thought of a lot of good examples here, maybe you could think of a few more. And in the third classroom in each school, the students got the score and the comments side by side on their exercise books. So they would come into the classroom, pick up their exercise books, look at the feedback, carry on working. At the end of the unit, they looked at their achievement. Students given scores had made no progress. The high scorers were positive and the low scorers were negative. Students given comments, their scores had gone up by 30%. High scores positive and the low scores are positive. So what I'd like you to do on your tables is to think about what do you think happened to the students given both scores and comments? Here's a reminder. Students given scores, no gain. High scores positive, low scores negative. Students given comments, 30% gain. High scores positive and low scores positive. So what happened to the students given both scores and comments? Two minutes before we vote. So, I'd like you now to vote by holding up one finger for A, two for B, three for C, four for D, and five for E, and can you all vote now, please? Okay, thank you. You went for B. Why do you go for B? Because the lowest score is not getting further than reading the score. Okay. Read the grade, won't bother reading the comments, and then won't move on in the learning. High score is motivated by the school to read the comments. Okay, you went for the same. Yeah, because we had the same, we had the same discussion. And yeah. Came to the same decision. Okay, uh, no. now you went for B as well, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. For the same reason? Yeah, we would they could just get distracted on school. Yeah, who who would? All the, the students. Lower, the lower ones. The lower achievers. The, the high achievers would be okay. They, yeah, they they look at we we felt that when we look at the school. <laughs> And then the right. um, and therefore the high achievers have got vested interest. Oh, this is good, so yeah. therefore I'll read the comment, whereas the lowers, I've looked at it and that's not looking at what it, 
got read something negative. Okay. And you, same reason for you, is it? Yeah. Yeah, but we were saying we actually get the kids to look at the comments and then write it down. So they've actually read that, but then they're still motivated. Mm -hmm. There's some people over here went for E. Yeah, why do you go for E? Well, we said really that it depended on the value of the comment to the person who was receiving it. Right. There was also other, it was a bit of everything in there, depending on how their self-esteem was, if they saw the score and didn't read the comment, mm -hmm. how they would interpret that information. There was lots of other fixed factors that could influence right. the outcome. So, see, A is the best of both worlds, isn't it? B is a kind of compromise. You get the gain from the comments, presumably, but you still get the polarization of attitudes from the scores. That's what you were saying, basically. C would be a, a balancing the other way around. You get a zero gain from the scores, but at least the, the, the positive comments make the low scorers feel a bit better about it. And D is, in your saying, it's the worst of all possible worlds, basically. And you're right. That's what happened. D. If you go and write careful, detailed diagnostic comments and then go and put a score on a grade, you're wasting your time. The kids who get high scores don't need to read the comments and the kids who get low scores don't want to. You'd be better off just giving them a score. They, they won't learn anything, but you will save yourselves a heck of a lot of time marking. And what's going on here is brought out by this study here, because here there were, tw there were eight classrooms, two classrooms given comments, two classrooms given grades, two classrooms given written praise, and two classrooms given no feedback at all. The two classrooms where the kids were given grades and the two classrooms where they were given written praise made the same amount of progress as the students given absolutely no feedback whatsoever. The only students that made greater progress were the students given comments. So much for this that students need to know where they are. Well, most of your students know where they are. They can put their class in rank order for every subject just as well as any teacher can. What they don't need is to be reminded of it all the time. And yet, if they can get it, they want that feedback. We are codependents in this in this relationship. We've got our students <coughs> hooked on grades and levels and scores. And we are, we are pushers because we're going along with it. Now, I understand the pressure because students want those grades. You know, we're the same. Before I gave up trying to lose weight, when I'd been good, I wanted feedback. I know you're only meant to weigh yourself once a week, but after a day on salad, you want some feedback, don't you? So you get on the <laughs> scales. And if you lost weight, you feel great, you don't want to eat. But if you haven't lost weight, or even worse, you put weight on, you get depressed and go looking for the nearest cake shop, don't you? <laughs> I understand that feedback, but I only want it if it's going to be good, and I don't know if it's going to be good until I get it. And that's the trap we've created with our students. Now, in America, um, teachers are so worried about students' self-esteem, they just lie to the kids, you know, this is great. So you end up with a bunch of kids who feel really good about themselves, but can't actually do anything. You know, whereas in this country, we tell it like it is, don't we? Well, if you work really hard on this subject, you might get a G. Thanks. The, the, the real key issue here is that feedback should cause thinking. How many people in this room believe that your students spend as long taking on board the feedback you give them as it takes, as it takes you to provide it? <laughs> Anybody? That's got to change. Feedback should be more work for the recipient than the donor. That's rule number one. We were talking to some girls the other day, and, and one of them said, when a teacher makes a lot of comments on your work, it means it wasn't very good. I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, if you do a really good piece of work and you get an A, you just get a word like excellent. But if there's lots of things wrong with your work, you get lots of comments on it. So we, we realized that a lot of students think that feedback is bad. The more feedback you get, the worse your work must have been. So we started thinking, how can we address this? So, um, uh, if you saw, saw uh, Miss Overbury in, in, in the video, what she did, um, she actually, students did some writing, and then she just put cir circled numbers at various points in the text, and then at the bottom, that she'd written three questions, question one, question two, question three, and so the, the next day, when the kids came back in and picked their, their books, there was work for them to do. So the first 10 minutes was responding to the questions the teacher had asked, and every student, no matter how good your work was, every student had work to do as a result of the feedback. So um, comment only marking is obviously very powerful. Many teachers have given comments rather than grades, but most teachers are still not very impressed with the amount of attention the students give to reading the comments. A teacher I've worked with in Enfield, what she does now, she was teaching year 10 Shakespeare and um, 
she'd given the students an essay to do, took the essays in. She used to write the comments on the bottom of the student's notebook, exercise book. But now what she does is she writes them on strips of paper, and each group of four students gets back their four essays and the four strips of paper, and they have to work out which comment goes with which essay. Now the students are reading the comments. They have to. Focus marking. I used to train teachers. I used to sit at the back of these teachers' classrooms, and I would um, just give feedback. You know, I'd write pages of comments about all the things they'd done wrong, and I would bestow this wonderful gift of feedback, sometimes three pages in a 45-minute lesson of all the mistakes they'd made. And I was being completely ineffective, and I realized it was because I was giving too much feedback. <coughs> So I started giving them less feedback. I started saying things like, by the time I come and see you in two weeks' time, I want you to work on this and this. I gave less feedback and had more impact because I was making them accountable for doing something with it. And exactly the same thing is true for students. We give our students far too much feedback of poor quality and don't require them to do anything with it. Training students to pose questions. You know how a typical teacher finishes off a topic? They say, right, anybody got any questions? No, right, good. <laughs> on to the next topic, chapter. So rather than just doing that, you can say, right, anybody got any questions? Decide in your tables if you've got any questions. And if you ask everybody in your group your question and they haven't got an answer, it's not a stupid question. And some teachers have found it very valuable to go even further and require the students to write the questions on strips. And it does two things. First of all, it gives you information that you can actually deal with more coherently because if, the, if there's three different tables with, who've asked the same kind of question, you can deal with them in a law, more logical sequence. But the other thing it does is makes the students develop their language skills. And a, a math teacher was telling me, my kids used to say things like, I can't do quadratics. And when she would ask them, what can't you do? They would say, I can't do any of it, you know, usual helpful response. And she said, now they say things like, I can't do it when there's a minus in front of, a of the x squared. So what teachers found was that students were becoming much more precise in their asking of questions as a result of the teachers making them write their questions on strips of paper. Now, <clears throat> the most misunderstood and misused technique is traffic lights. I, uh, you know, most uses of traffic lights I see are pretty bad um, because it's a self-report. It's no better than, everybody okay with that? You know, because the teacher says, okay, Give yourself a traffic light, green means you understand, red, so yellow means you're not so sure, red means you have no idea what's going on. And what happens? Boys give themselves greens, where girls will give themselves yellows. One teacher addressed this by actually saying, okay, red's over here with me, greens help the yellows, yellows make sure the greens understand this quite as well as they think they do. In other words, green became a signal, I'm now ready to teach this to somebody else. And all of a sudden, the boys were a lot more careful about signaling green. <laughs> Now, another teacher tried these colored discs. She was saying, this is A-level maths. Why wait until the end of the lesson? So she got every kid a disc, green on one side, red on the other. And at the beginning of the lesson, the green side is uppermost. And if you want to say the teacher's going a bit fast for you, you're getting a bit lost, you turn the disc over to red. And what this teacher has discovered, this teacher discovered, is kids who hadn't asked a question all year were willing to show the red disc. And then we heard a story that was, was really quite surprising. This girl at the back of the class had flipped over the disc to red, and the teacher was still at the front of the overhead projector <coughs> going through this complicated bit of trigonometry and had basically had forgotten to check for red discs. So she was going through this, no, paying no attention to the class, just chatting away. And this girl is getting more and more frustrated and she turns to her two friends and realizes that they haven't got a clue what's going on either. So she grabbed their discs and starts waving to the teacher to slow down. And we thought, what an amazing student. But we actually then heard more and more of these kinds of stories. More and more of these stories where if the teacher opened up the channel of communication with the student, the student would use it. And it led to a couple of quite scary moments. Um, one of the teachers we worked with in, in Medway, he was telling us that he was teaching one of those lessons you know, I'm sure you've had them. Those lessons where you know it's not working, but you can't stop yourself. <laughs> you know, at the bottom of a deep hole and still <coughs> digging, yeah. So this teacher was, it was, it was, it was year eight, it was science, it was July, it was hot, and he's trying to get more and more students' faces, trying to wake them up, and it's not working. And then all of a sudden, a little lad at the back of the class puts his hand up and says, Sir, this isn't working, is it? 
And I was speaking to the teacher afterwards and he said, a year ago I would have been so angry with that student for embarrassing me. But this teacher had been trying to get the students to take more responsibility for their own learning. So this teacher said, you're absolutely right, what should we do? And what was interesting was not one student suggested going and having a break and playing out on the grass. They had a sensible conversation about how to improve their learning of science. And I think what's interesting about this story is not only was the student's ego absent from the classroom, but so was the teacher's. The teacher had the grace to realize that that student was throwing him a lifeline and he had the sense to grasp it. Another teacher, again, A-level maths, tried the discs. She couldn't see them in her classroom because of the fluorescent lights. So she went down to the party store, um, www.partyplus.co.uk. Okay. People always ask me, where do you get the cups from? Okay. Every student has three cups. Beginning of the lesson, green cup showing. If you think the teacher's going a bit fast, you show yellow. And if you want to stop and ask a question, you show red. Why would anyone show red? Because in this classroom, the rule is that as soon as one student shows red, the teacher uses the lollipop sticks to choose another student at random, and whoever's chosen has to come to the front of the class to answer the question being posed by the student who showed red. This teacher describes what she's doing as converting her classroom into one gigantic game of chicken. <laughs> and her current problem is the students are stopping the lesson all the time, saying, I don't get it. Isn't that a great problem to have? Students who are so willing to tell you they don't get it. In fact, she's changed the rule now. Her new rule is you can't stop the lesson more than once. And if you want to stop the lesson a second time, get somebody else to do it. But, and as you saw in the TV program, this, this is also very useful when you've got students doing individual seat work. So green means I'm okay, yellow means I have a question but it's not stopping me from working, and red means I'm stuck and I can't make any progress without you. And it works very well in computer rooms because you can put them, well, until you replace them with flat screens obviously, but putting them on top of the monitors actually gives a teacher a very quick way of triaging their time in the classroom. And then finally, um, end of lesson students review. The idea here is that Instead of the teacher conducting the end of lesson plenary, a student does it. And we started doing this with um, schools in, in, in Kent, and I, I was very skeptical, I have to say. I thought, you'll only get the good kids volunteering. And I was amazed that within about a week of this starting, that every single student in the class wanted to play a part. Because they wasn't, it wasn't about embarrassing them or showing them up, they were actually helping participate in the whole class's learning. And that's, that's a really interesting thing we saw in the TV program. Um, I don't know if you saw William speaking about this, but he was saying that his class had become much more cohesive and much more supportive of each other. Even the able students were saying that they didn't realize that some of the other students had interesting things to say. And so as a consequence of this opening up the classroom, of being a classroom, a, a classroom as a safe place to make mistakes and to get things wrong, indeed, there is probably no other point in being in the classroom. A teacher I work with in Scotland has got a poster on her wall which just says, stuck, question mark, good, it was worth coming in today. And that made a deep impression on me because it's not the message we send, is it? But this place where a classroom is a safe place for making mistakes, where the teacher is constantly getting high quality information to adjust her teaching to better meet the students' learning needs, and the students are understanding that it's, you know, if, you do, if you're confused or you're, or you're wrong, it's important to be open and honest about that because then the teacher or the rest of the class can help you. And as I said, we saw knock-on effects on, I mean, the, the head teacher said that, uh, did an interview with William at the end of the program, which wasn't in the program, but it was in the, um, in the, one of the, one of the uh, newspaper articles, and William actually turned, said he'd, he's, he's now become better behaved at home because, you know, he just feels, feels more relaxed. And so the final point I want to make before we stop at 10 is that the danger is that people see assessment for learning as this year's initiative. So I, I've lost track of the number of schools who've actually decided, oh yes, we'll do EFL, we'll do teacher learning communities. And check, done that now. AFL, assessment for learning, the idea that you can improve the way you find out from your students what they've learned, so you can improve your teaching to better meet their learning needs, is the lifelong agenda for all teachers. You will never, ever tick this off, because you'll never, ever get to a point where you're doing it so well that you can afford to, to, to stop doing it. So for me, the important thing about teacher learning communities and assessment for learning is that they are the most important parts of teaching 
combined with a recognition that every teacher needs to improve their practice as long as they're working because this job is so hard that you never get any good at it. It's just too hard, isn't it? I mean, you show me a teacher who thinks they're doing a good job, I will show you a teacher with low expectations of her students. Our daily experience is failure. We teach these great lessons, we take in the kids' books, and we realize you know, that they didn't get it. So every teacher needs to get better, not because they're not good enough, but because they can be even better. And I think that the focus on what did the students learn as a result of what I did as a teacher is the only important thing in teaching. It is, assessment functions as the bridge between teaching and learning. It's only by assessing that you can work out whether what you've done as a teacher has had the intended effect. So assessment is the process, the central process in effective teaching. And that's why I think that it should be the central process in all teacher professional development from now until you retire or die. <laughs>